A roller coaster ride of a week winds down for meme stocks, medals, and treasuries alike. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. It's triple witching, but like nothing happening. I almost like, forgot about the triple witching. I know. And I still don't know what they did with that fourth witch. Because nothing's happening. <laughs> uh, so it's been quite a week to be sure, but currently not a lot's going on. So the S&P is pretty much flat, but the S&P is now up for a weekly gain. Four weeks in a row. We haven't seen that streak uh, since February. Other superlatives coming your way over the next couple hours. Individually, one of the best performing stocks is Freeport McMahon Copper and Gold. And the why is in the name copper and gold, both at record highs. Freeport at the highest level since July of 2011. Silver, highest level since 2013. We're going to break down the why behind all of that. And here's your check-in on the 10-year yield. Uh, yields up by about four basis points. Barclays scraps its short call on the 10-year, though. Quite interesting. Uh, headed into next week for me. Yeah, interesting, too. As we close out the week, we could take a closer look at that once dormant meme stock mania that, of course, reawakened on Monday and Tuesday. That's faded a bit here to end the week, at least for the two pillars of that trade, GameStop and AMC. But there are still embers out there burning in the ash pile. Take a look at Tupperware, up more than 20% today, erasing losses from the past two, locking in what's now going to be its best week going back to October. Rent the one runway on a seven-day rally right now that's more than doubled its market value over that stretch. And Robinhood right now on track for its best week of the year. A conversation up ahead with Professor Jeremy Siegel about investor psychology and the behavioral narrative right now around the follow the herd mentality. Mentality. But city strategist Scott Croner already had something to say on that topic, telling clients in a note today that a contrarian indicator measuring stock trader sentiment, that that re-entered euphoric territory this week, lowering the probability of forward returns over the next year. Cronert writing that the wild moves in meme stocks are hard to explain using any traditional logic, but does provide perspective that the system is still awash with liquidity despite what Jay Powell says about tighter financial conditions. Those looser conditions also on display in two other pockets of the market this week. Metals, which Alex was just talking about, and Treasuries. A Bloomberg Industrial Metals sub-index right now on pace for its best week in almost a year and a half as copper trades around its record highs. And then there's that Treasury rally showing renewed signs of life. Amid all that confluence of economic data this week, bond funds right now logging a 21st straight week of inflows, according to Bank of America. And Michael Hartnett, the strategist over there, saying that with the anticipated next moves in monetary policy and the risks to corporate profits, investors should prepare for an even greater reversal of that anything but bonds trade, Alex, in the second half of this year. But here's how my question is yesterday, too. Why would you sell stocks right now? Like, what's that reason? And I don't really have one. And you were just talking about it. Financial conditions, this shows kind of, well, it's hard to argue with that stock rally. The blue line is the U.S. Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index. The white line is the S&P. Super basic. As it goes uh, lower, it means financial conditions are tighter. And as you can see, the, they track relatively the same. Clearly, after COVID, there was an influx of stimulus, and that was a whole different story. But you can see little dip. A little dip, move over here, see some tightening in financial conditions, equities kind of follow suit. And then here's the why. After financial conditions kind of bottomed out here at the end of 2023, they've been steadily climbing higher and have now kind of leveled out, and that's helped propel the S&P higher as well. So until this materially tightens, why wouldn't you own stocks? Why wouldn't it be just a buy everything rally remain except for the dollar? All right, let's kick things off to the close right now with Christian Lawrence, senior cross asset macro strategist over at Rival Bank. And Christian, I'll ask that question of you too. Is there still a case to be made for stocks, particularly given that they're sitting at record highs right now? Yeah, I certainly think so. I think we'll continue to see inflows, and I think there's further upside from here. It goes back to that liquidity point of view, and it really raises the question, are rates restrictive? If we're seeing record highs in equities, we're seeing crypto flying, we're seeing credit spreads tightening throughout the last year, I'd argue rates probably aren't restrictive at the moment. Well, this gets to a broader... Wait, I'm sorry, you think they are restrictive? Aren't. Aren't, aren't restrictive, yeah, yeah. right, because that gets to kind of what Scott Croner was talking about as well, this idea here that we wouldn't have had the meme stock rally if things were tight. Yeah. We wouldn't have had some of the other moves that we saw even prior to the meme stock rally this week if things were tight. Why do you think, though, we're hearing from j Powell and other Fed members trying to make this case, at least publicly, 
that things are tight? Are they just trying to sell us on something that they themselves don't necessarily believe? Well, I mean, we've certainly seen Powell essentially remove that right tail risk of, of potential rate increases, but I think they're going to be stuck at where they are for some time to come. We're not going to see these aggressive rate cuts that uh, we've seen priced in. I mean, if you think about the market, we've gone from, in the last six months, two rate cuts to seven rate cuts, back to two, one rate cut, then back to two rate cuts again. So there's a lot of noise around this, and I think there's a lot of uncertainty. I mean, the bottom line is, just look at the Fed's dot plot. For the end of next year, you have one member that thinks rates will be double where another member of the Fed thinks they'll be. And I think a lot of the problem is essentially we're talking about economic theory as though they're rules of physics. And the bottom line is economic theories work for certain periods of time. And in different periods of time, those same economic theories don't work the same way. And to that point, I mean, you're right. Fed officials have not been talking about that, except Kashkari kind of raised it this week. Like, have we seen financial conditions tighten enough? Is it tight enough? To you, does that mean just no cut or does it mean a hike? I think the, the bar to hike's pretty high, partly okay. because I think Powell essentially ruled it out. Um, but it's not just that. Is it really going to make a big difference if we raise rates another 50 basis points? The bottom line is inflation has come down considerably, but it's not because the Fed raised rates. It's been mainly about the supply side. If you look at the areas where Fed rate increases are supposed to impact, things like core services inflation, mm -hmm. we haven't really seen any easing. Right. I'm glad you brought that up. So Rick Reeder was on with David Weston for Wall Street Week, and uh, the big headline that came out of that was that actually, if you want to tame inflation, cut rates. Because people who have money are now making so much money, whether in treasuries, whether in money market funds, whether in high-yielding uh, savings accounts, that that's helping spur that services demand and services inflation. I know it sounds a little turkey-esque, but like, is there any truth to that from your point of view? I think in the current environment, yes, there is some truth in that. There's hmm. essentially a transfer of wealth from the government to savers to big corporates with large cash piles. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we need to rip up the economic textbook, although I think some probably should be ripped up. Um, but it doesn't mean that that's always going to be the case. But right now, I think there's a strong argument to be made that rates have been somewhat inflationary, yeah. This guy, well, then, what, well, then how does the Fed sort of combat that, though? Because everything you're saying here makes it sound like the Fed kind of has their hands tied right now. I mean, they've done what they can do with the rate hikes already. I don't think adding one or two more 25 basis point hikes yeah. is really going to change much. Well, I mean, what can they do? Well, I'd argue their hands are, are pretty tight. Yeah. I mean, if you think about monetary transmission mechanisms, one of the main ways it usually works is through to the mortgage market. But the spread between effective mortgage rates and current mortgage rates has never been so wide. Yeah. Essentially, you're in an environment where largely, I think, because of the structure of the housing market at the moment, the monetary policy is not that effective in driving the real world. Is fiscal policy complicating things? Yes, oh, definitely. Yeah. Fiscal policy, I would argue, is the main driver of inflation at the moment. And the Fed can't do anything about that. No, nope, no, nope, it certainly can't. And it can't do anything about the supply side. So I think when you look at the supply side of things, which I do think is the main reason we've seen inflation come down, mm -hmm. well, I think the good news there is probably behind us. I do think there's mm -hmm. room to see some of those supply pressures re-emerge, particularly when it comes to the pass-through from energy prices, uh, potential rise in shipping costs earlier this year passing through. So I'd argue the good news on the supply side is probably over. All right, Christian, uh, really interesting uh, stuff here. Christian Lawrence there, senior cross-asset macro strategist over at Rabble Bank, helping us kick you off to the close here on this Friday afternoon. When we come back, a look at the big rally and, well, the big drop that we saw for some of the meme stocks. Jeremy Siegel over at the Wharton School going to stop in by to talk about investor psychology. Plus, Jeff Curry calls copper the best trade he's ever seen on the long side. We're going to break down what's driving the record highs for the metal. And Robinhood, believe it or not, on track for its best week of the year, sending longtime bear Craig Siegenthaler to deliver a double upgrade. Everyone back in the pool right now that's part of our top calls, and it's coming up in just a second, right here on The Close on Bloomberg. I'm confident that this time it's liftoff and I think we're going to see more momentum behind it because you have three sources of demand this time around, meaning green capex, AI, plus military. Back in 2021, all we had was the green capex demand and now it's in full force, supply's not there, inventories are tight. That was Carlisle's Jeff Curry on his expectations for copper prices, which are trading right at record highs. It's been quite a week for copper. Joining us for more is Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Mike McGlone. Mike, there's a couple different things happening in a couple different metal markets, but I just want to focus on copper. 
What is your biggest takeaway from this week? Because a lot of it had to do with short covering, a short squeeze that happened in the copper market, and dislocation between prices in London and prices in New York, uh, prices in the U.S. What happened? Yeah, I think that's the start and where we should start for the week, Alex. Uh, pretty, it's free, future shenanigans. There was a significant short squeeze in the front copper futures to trade on this on the CME, the trades in pounds, it popped up to five. Just about a month ago, it was four. It squeezed those front contracts and the backs are much lower, but that steep contango reminding me of when silver peaked around 50 in 2011. It usually it's very rare in copper, but so far it's worked. The thing is, you look at managed money net positions in overall copper, they're pretty long. They're very long. I mean, the hedge funds are about 30% of open interest. So we just had some nuances in the copper squeeze in New York, so that contract's made a new high. In London, it hasn't. And to me, it's very scary when I see something like that because copper's very autocorrelated. Now, I believe, I believe in, in the long term what Jeff says, but Jeff, when he comes out with things like that, I've known him for decades, is oftentimes they can make peaks, i.e. crude oil at 130 a year ago. It's dropped 50%, I'm sorry, two years ago. So now I'm worried about the little autocorrelation factors in copper with this, this future squeeze. I am curious, too, when we talk about, Mike, the, the potential for this rally to continue, if it is something more than just a short squeeze, if there is something else driving it here, is there any enough resistance on the other side of the trade that might actually blunt additional gains? Are you seeing anything in, those, in that data? Well, in, in the micro, um, it's, it's uh, remain, it's the positions. They're, they're very long. 30% of open, open interest in copper futures is about as high as it gets. So positions are already long. I suspect that's going to change. We'll see that data later today. And then the macro is, I think, a little bit more of a headwind than he thinks. First of all, China bond yields are dropping to the lowest in our database, 2.3% in a 10-year-old CGB versus 4 point whatever, 4.5% in, in US. That's a sign of deflationary um, trends in China. And then there's beta, the U.S. stock market at record highs and S&P 500 about 100, about 20 percent above its 100-week moving average. Those are things that will revert and put pressure on copper in the short term, which I think is part of the problem here. We're seeing some animal spirits. Mm -hmm. It's just a lesson you learn in copper and silver. When it spikes like this, let the futures guy have it. The prudent traders are probably lightening up a little bit. No, Mike, you bring up a great point because I think that Jeff is really much talking about a structural shift in the market and that longer-term demand from things like the energy transition, whereas you're also talking about it as still a very cyclical metal, very much tied to China. Where does silver fall in this relationship? Because silver, out of nowhere, 2013 high. That's right. It's, it's right in the middle, Alex. I'm glad we went there. Silver, to me, is between copper and gold. And remember, what, what's happened here? Everything's following gold, at least all the metals. Gold's been sitting at record highs and been, and been on that trajectory since early in the year, and it's still doing it. And who's buying gold? Central banks led by China. So there's potential that China's hoarding other metals. But silver, to me, is also, it's known as the devil metal, devil's metal for a reason. It's breaking out, but it's got, and it's got a lot of room. But that silver-gold ratio dropped to 77 now. That's usually pretty good support level, particularly with the stock market very expensive. So I still think gold's going to be the better one by the end of the year. But overall, this is a bit of a revenge of the nerds. I encouraged Bloomberg, um, Bloomberg Index to create the Bloomberg All Metals Index about five years ago. To me, metals and commodities are the best place to go for the long term, and it's showing it right now. All right, Mike McGlone, Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst uh, down there in Miami. A closer look, spot gold right now at that $2,400 level here in the U.S. And, of course, copper. I know you've been keeping an eye on that, Alex, at least on the LME right now. Ten, uh, basically right below 10700 Yeah, and then yeah. here in the U.S. is about uh, $5 a pound. Um, but what I do find really interesting is that the longer bet for copper and just I feel like research report after research report, they're upgrading their long-term targets in a big, big way. Mm. And all you have to do is look at, say, BHP trying to make a bid for Anglo. Yeah. I'm sure BHP is going to be like, we're good without Anglo, no problem. But that's a pure, like, I want to buy those copper mines kind of thing. I still though, feel like the trade is getting a little lopsided, right? I mean, even totally. if you believe what, what Curry was talking about, with the meaning of the structural things, the mm -hmm. fundamental mental mm -hmm. things that will dry this. And I think most people buy into that. It's really about timing. Yes. And is the price where we're at today, is that really warranted given that a lot of what he's talking about is still a, a few years into the future? And we saw that with lithium a few years yes. back too. They're yeah. like, okay guys, yeah. we need it for EVs and then everyone mined it and then all of a sudden prices cratered and they had to close up the mines. And then you remember the great uranium rally a little yes. while? Is that back? I haven't looked at uranium in a while, but I'm, I'm sure we'll be talking about that sometime soon. I actually before. got pitched a uranium CEO, so I'll get back to you on okay, that. Okay, Alex Seal will definitely <laughs> be booking uh, someone on uranium. You can bet on that. Meanwhile, we're keeping an eye on uh, what's going on in the equity markets as well. And one of the big gainers 
winners today is Robinhood, on track for its best week of the year. And analysts at Bank of America finally taking notice, reversing their stance here with a double upgrade. It's one of our top calls, and it's coming up next here on The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with Bath and Body Works, the retailer of candles, lotions, fragrances, getting a boost to neutral from underweight over at J.P. Morgan with the analyst seeing potential for a return to revenue growth in the current quarter. And he touts some inflection within e-commerce sales and implies that this partnership that, bed, uh, that Bath and Body Works has with Netflix and the hit show Bridgerton may have something to do with it, saying both web traffic data and Google search trends showing that that candle collaboration might actually be paying off. Those shares higher by about 2% on the day. Darden Restaurants, that's up next. The owner of casual dining brands like Olive Garden and Longhorn Steakhouse upgraded to buy over at BTIG with the analysts saying investor concern about sales and consumer appetite is, quote, overly worrisome. He also suggests that the company lean further into advertising promotions or at least modest price increases to drive same store sales growth. Those shares get into decent bid on the day, up about one and a half percent. And finally, let's take a look at Robinhood. A good day and a good week for that stock as analysts over at Bank of America raise their recommendation to buy from underperform, citing rising engagement from retail traders driven by, yeah, this week's meme stock media as also because of accelerating organic growth that will drive earnings up in the coming years. Those shares having a phenomenal day, 12% higher from where they were yesterday, and those are some of our top calls. We do want to sit with that last one there on Robinhood here. You see the numbers on your board. You see the numbers for your week. The man behind that double upgrade, Craig Siegenthaler, joining us right now, managing director over at Bank of America. And I am curious to hear, Craig, about this call. Is this based on some of the, I guess, activity that we saw with regards to meme stocks this week, or is this based more on something a little bit more long-term and sustainable? So honestly, it had nothing to do with what happened this week. There's really two things. There's a very long-term trend, which is the fact that millennials, Gen Zs, Gen Xs, my children, um, they're gonna interact and invest through mobile. And, and this is a long, long-term secular shift towards mobile, which Robinhood is in the center of. The second thing is the cyclical trend, and that's it. We think we are in the early innings of a multi-year period of rising retail engagement. This will help Robinhood's organic growth, trading levels, and even things like margin loan usage. I am curious, though. I mean, given that you basically did a double upgrade here, Craig, something clearly changed for you. So why does the story look different to you today with the, with the note that you put out versus, I don't know, a few weeks ago or even a few months ago? What's changed? I think there's a lot of octane in the Robinhood stock and their financial statements. And what I mean by that is bear markets will be very bad for Robinhood because their clients will go dark. They'll become less active. They won't trade a lot. They won't open accounts at the same uh, frequency. And in bull markets, it, it's the opposite. And we saw this already. We saw this play out in the 2019 to 2021 COVID period, which was actually a perfect storm for them, um, when all the results were very, very strong. But remember, when the Fed started raising rates, um, and, and as I call it, things went dark, activity levels slowed. Now, that's when we rated the stock and underperform through that bear market period. What we're saying today is we think there's a multi-year period, which is the opposite of that, rising retail engagement, which is better organic growth and better trading levels. Craig, is there a direct correlation between things like the jobs number or average hourly earnings or household savings that this stock will then correlate based on that thesis? Yes, but uh, indirectly. At the end of the day, we want a really strong stock market. We want lower interest rates. Um, and, and combined, that'll drive higher retail engagement. Um, in my view, that economic setup and the economic variables that drive that um, will, will make Robinhood a very strong stock. And the B of A econ team is looking for the first Fed rate cut in December, followed by more. Lower interest rates um, are good because they supply the financial markets with more liquidity 
um, and that should drive up stock markets and also should drive up retail engagement, which is really the theme of what we did today. Craig, how do you price in the broader risks, for example, right? We got a Wells notice from the U.S. SEC uh, warning that Robinhood faces an enforcement action over its crypto business. Like nothing firm, right? But these are the risks that are still percolating. How do you discount for that? So the Robinhood stock was $20 um, a little bit ago and sold off to 16 around the Wells notice. So I thought a lot of that was priced in. Now, with Robinhood, they have a very conservative offering of coins and capabilities, which I think should help with their scenario uh, with regulators. And, and also, there's a lot of variables in play. We don't know who will be president next year, for one. We don't know who will be running the SEC. So these things take time. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, they have a very conservative offering of coins and capabilities, which should help them through this scenario. Uh, let's get to a broader question, too, uh, uh, Craig, about competition in this space. Uh, when Robinhood sort of came on the scene and, and it sort of was capturing all this imagination and attention, we did see some of the more established competitors try to broaden out uh, their offerings to appeal more to the retail cohorts that Robinhood seemed to have a lock on. Is there any concern here? that we could see maybe a further push by some of those competitors into that space? Um, I think they're very different. Um, I think at Robinhood, they made investing fun. They also give you a very high value proposition to clients, and they leverage technology to do that. And what I mean by that is you trade for free, not just stock, but also uh, crypto for free. So um, you get a lot of value out of that platform because they can sell their orders to market makers. Also, if you're a Robinhood Gold customer, you get about 5% on your cash. Compare that to Charles Schwab, that's only 45 basis points. So we think they have a very competitive offering. We think they have a strong brand name with individuals aged 20 to 40. Um, and and though their average account size is actually only $4,000, so as these younger investors accumulate wealth and age, we think they're going to stay at Robinhood, mm -hmm. and we think this will have a very positive impact on the size of Robinhood's accounts. All right, Craig, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Thanks for jumping on with us. Craig uh, Sagenhalter over at Bank of America. I mean, it's the gamification of stock trading, right? Yeah. I mean, and it, I mean, I, obviously, I don't know if they pioneered it, but they certainly popularized it here. But I do worry, though, because I, I feel like now everybody's doing this. I know. Yeah. Also, like, do we want 19-year-olds doing that? Uh, like accumulating wealth is different than trading stuff. Anyway, the psychology behind all of it. Speaking of, Jeremy Siegel, Professor Emeritus at the Wharton School of the UPenn, will be joining us. This is Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. You guessed it, it was the week of the meme stocks. And I wanted to take a look at a five-day chart, Romain, because, like, yes, we've sold off. Yeah. But nevertheless, we've still added net from last Friday, like a billion dollars in market cap to GameStop on just one tweet that yeah. meant nothing. That, the, that meant nothing. <laughs> and we just point out, I mean, we're only up, like, something like, I think, what, 18 or something percent on the week, despite the fact we were up, like, what, yeah, yeah. like 200 percent uh, after Tuesday. But it gets to this idea of, why would people even chase after that? I mean, like, the psychology behind it is, like, you have this cryptic tweet. And, look, I get it. He was obviously kind of the big, Roaring Kitty was obviously the big sort of catalyst for the last big meme stock frenzy in 2021. But, like, there was nothing else there. Right. So is it lose financial conditions? Is it, like, leftover savings? Is it just, like, people boredom? need fun? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it boredom? Like, we're not all sitting I at home so. anymore, yeah. right? So to help us with this conversation is Jeremy Siegel, Professor Emeritus of Finance at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Professor, help us understand, like, what did you make of what happened with GameStop this week? Yeah, that was a repeat of what happened a few years ago. And I'll, I'll say the same thing I said a few years ago. Long-term holders are not going to be happy in these stocks. In the short run, you're you're going to the casino. Mm -hmm. um, you may you may win big. You may have a lot of fun, but as a long term hold, uh, it is doomed. Uh, none of those are are going to produce uh, really any returns. So you know, Professor, last time everyone was sitting at home. Everyone had pandemic checks that they may not need to pay their bills, and that's what the excuse was for fueling all of this. Supposedly. That shouldn't be the case this time. Supposedly our household savings are being drawn down. We're charging more on credit cards. Everyone should be back in the office. So what gives? 
Well, you know, there's still that mystique. I mean, there was that movie, Dumb Money, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, sort of uh, glamorized uh, the, the whole process of, uh, you know, giving it to the sh uh, short sellers. And I think that ethos was still there. And boy, I mean, as you said, you know, one picture <laughs> could spark several billion dollars is, is something really to ponder about. Uh, when you're talking about quirks in the market. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm curious about when we talk about uh, sort of who has the power to really do that. And I know that this might be a bit of an anomaly, but we've seen this on a smaller scale from time to time where one particular person who has some degree of influence for, for, for one reason or another uh, comes out, says something, and then the whole herd just kind of just follows behind it blindly, if you will, here. Yeah. Uh, you understand just kind of how market psychology works. Is it materially different today than what it was, I don't know, 30 years ago? Or is just, or we're just kind of seeing a different iteration of it? You know, short, uh, Roman, short squeezes have been with us for centuries. Uh, you know, you, you can go back in the 19th century, those famous short squeezes on, on railroad stocks, and uh, there's been in the commodity market. Um, so, you know, this, these, these type of uh, situations, um, you know, certainly have occurred before. Um, that it's occurred in the way that it has with, you know, with young people rather than seasoned speculators is the difference. But uh, we certainly have had episodes of, 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 of this type of behavior in the past. Does that type of behavior, and more importantly, some of the market distortions that grow out of it, is that something material or is it just kind of like the market as a whole can just deal with it in passing and then at some point we get back to reality? Yeah, I mean, really, when you talk about the, you know, you said a, a billion, maybe two billion w was added. You know, when you consider the trillions of dollars in the stock market, it really does not have a big impact. I mean, some of the short squeezes uh, of the past in major stocks like railroads when they were flying back in the uh, late 19th century or when the Hunsk uh, had a short squeeze in the silver market. Um, I mean, those were things that really did matter. This, uh, again, is a lot of fun for a lot of people, but really in the big picture of equities is not very significant. I mean, it probably definitely mattered to Gabe Plotkin uh, a few, like a year and two years ago, but I know your point is taken. Um, I'm going to go to the topic that Wall Street loves to hate, and that's Dow at 40,000. It's a nice round number. We like round numbers. That's when I get the phone call from my mother-in-law asking me about Dow 40,000. Yeah. Is that a psychological milestone? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think all these 10,000s are, are, are psychological. 50, of course, will be the uh, kind of uh, half of that uh, uh, 10,000 uh, level. You know, we, we make a lot of, you know, everyone says, well, the Dow is 30 stock. You know, it is a very imperfect measure. It started back in the 19th century when uh, we didn't have computers, so you just added the price and divided by 30. Uh, it was something that people would do, and it was only calculated once an hour <laughs> back then. Uh, of course, our computers now are able to do any sort of math, so people make fun of it. The, the interesting thing is if you go back 50 years, uh, the compound return on the Dow has not only challenged the S&P, but actually exceeded the S&P. Uh, so uh, as an average, uh, in the long run, uh, I wouldn't make a lot of fun of it. Wow, okay. That feels yeah. counterintuitive to some uh, Wall Street believers over there. Uh, so I guess what happens now? Like, where, where do we end here? Well, I mean, you know, we could talk about whether we're, where are we with this whole market. I mean, we are, we are rich. Things are good on the earnings front. Um, you know, there's this big question about whether the Fed will cut or not. What I keep on saying is, Listen, there's good cuts and there's bad cuts. Bad cuts, if the economy slows a lot, that's not going to be good for the stock market. Good cuts, if inflation slows with the economy strong, wow, that's going to you know continue to propel the market upward. So it's not just a matter of waiting for cuts. It's a question of what will prompt those cuts. I do think we're going to have some at, at year end. And you know I'm very hopeful that it's going to be that decline on the inflation front. Uh, do, when you look at market fundamentals, then, I mean, even in anticipation of those cuts, Jeremy, the question then has to be asked, uh, are economic fundamentals supportive of corporate fundamentals, which in turn would be supportive of market valuations? If we don't get those cuts, does that matter? Yeah, well, we're selling, what, well, maybe 20 to 21 times 
forward earnings. Certainly, that's a bit richer than history. I've actually argued that that really it should be selling at that. That normally stocks sell at kind of too much of a discount uh, uh, to to their fundamentals. So uh, you know, when there's degrees of optimism, you get back up to what I think is a, a, a fundamental uh, valuation. But um, yeah, you know, it, it's quite interesting because the real economic indicators have fallen short of expectation. You know, a lot of people are talking about a 4% GDP. Now we're barely talking about a 3% GDP in the second quarter. Now that's not terrible. Uh, there might actually be a downward revision now that we got the data on retail sales on the first quarter. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, that the growth isn't quite as strong as we had hoped for. Uh, sticky inflation. We hope that... Uh, you know, the, 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 I've talked about the rental component being distorted and hopefully lower rents are, are going to eventually uh, fall into that index. So there's a lot of positives. A lot of technically it still looks good. I mean, we don't see any sign of recession, but we have to keep our eyes open. Um, and as I said, this this last week, week and a half, I think almost every real indicator actually came in below expectations. Yeah. So I just watch those things to see whether that is going to accumulate or not. Um, again, uh, it could just be temporary. All right. I'm uh, going to have to leave it there. Professor, always wonderful uh, to talk to you. And by the way, wonderful tie you got there. You Jeremy's guys are twinning. You're twinning. You. We're just pointing this out. They get, they're twinning. <laughs> All right, Professor uh, Emeritus over at the Wharton School, over at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Jeremy uh, Siegel. And I, I think uh, this last point, I think, really kind of hits it on, too. I mean, it goes beyond market psychology. Maybe there is a case to be made for, a fundamental case to be made for where valuations are right now. Absolutely. Not necessarily and for GameStop, but right? I'm talking no, about no, the broad no, but, market. But yeah. For, you know, you deliver yeah. the numbers, yeah, you deliver yeah. the goods, and yeah. this will be a good test for NVIDIA next week, uh, and your stock can rally. What I find really confusing is that obviously the NFIB survey, better than before, right? But still, small business confidence is nowhere near no. public CEO confidence, right? Yeah. Uh, consumer confidence, nowhere near profits that we're seeing for big companies. Yeah. And eventually, that's how does that square itself? Yeah, well, it'll square itself economically. I don't know, for the markets, I guess people will Maybe. always say, look, I mean, the S&P is, you know, a reflection of the large cap economy. Economy and not necessarily the Main Street economy, if you will, here. A lot more uh, coming up here on the show. We've talked about Robin Hood. We've talked about GameStop. Well, let's talk about Reddit. Those shares also soaring today after announcing a new partnership with ChatGPT maker OpenAI. It's our stock of the hour, and it's coming up next on The Close on Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for our stock of the hour and a closer look at Reddit, the shares of the social media forum, uh, unveiling a brand partnership with OpenAI to bring its content to chat, GPT, and other products. It will also let Reddit add new AI features to its online communities. Abigail Doolittle joining us to talk a little bit more about this. 10% pop here on the day, not a bad day. I think it's probably going to be their best day or maybe best week since they went public back in March. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's definitely a good yeah. day. Investors cheering this partnership. So if we break it down in terms of what both sides get, so relative to what Reddit gets, they basically get a let's call it $40 million revenue stream every year, mm -hmm. uh, plus the possibility of being able to put AI interface into uh, their boards, which I don't use. I don't know if you guys use. Actually, I shouldn't say that. I use every now and then through a Google search. And then uh, you do use? Yeah. What, what's your username? Is uh, your I, I, I haven't even made it that far. <laughs> I just peek in every now and then. Uh, OpenAI, they, of course, uh, you know, ChatGPT lives and breathes on the data. So they get all the data. What makes it so interesting, though, is just last week, this isn't new. They've been getting this data for a long time. But Ch Chat, or excuse me, Reddit last week put in policies in place no longer making it free. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, CEO told us, Steve Hoffman, back in uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago at the Bloomberg Technology Summit. Our data is extremely valuable. We're seeing a lot of interest in it. So they are now monetizing it. So there's 40 to $50 million that's expected from so this. So I'm totally stealing this take from Paul Sweeney, who's an investment banker, a former investment banker on media. And he was saying, like, this is gold. 
like you IPO and you say, I'm going to make a revenue stream off of giving my data to LLM uh, providers, and that's how I'm going to wind up getting money. And then they do it after they IPO. Like yeah. he was saying that they issued shares again. He'd be like, I would definitely buy it because of that. So I'm wondering if there are more deals. Well, you know, it's interesting because they the stock is up more than 80% from the IPO. So they have executed on what they said that they were going to do. They did sign with Alphabet in January a $60 million deal to help train large language mo models, basically the technology beneath AI, uh, but they have a total of $203 million so far. Uh, so that's for Reddit. Open AI, which is interesting, a different side of it, not really to Paul's point, but in terms of the deals here, Dot Dash, Meredith, and FT. I mean, it reminds me a lot of the content, um, the race for content in streaming. Mm -hmm. Now there's this race for data. They're just so, yes, oh, it yeah. could be a, just a gold mine going forward for Reddit in terms of all these different companies. Did Reddit say how much uh, of a cut they're going to give their users for selling their data? They did not. That's a good point. Since I don't have a username, they're going to maybe just let you them. do. Don't, don't, maybe don't, you don't, can don't, bring that to them and ask for a royalty. Don't, don't take the bait. I'm just trolling. Uh, he they're, not, so they're not good. paying them anything. Abigail, <laughs> thank you very much. Abigail Doolittle joining us there. I, I don't believe that you're on Reddit. I am. I don't believe it. I am. That, I, how do you know? This is. I just post you know, everything about what goes on behind the scenes. That's, he doesn't do that. All right, coming up, we're going to count dark. you down to the closing bell. <laughs> uh, Helen is, uh, has an, is chief market strategist over at FL Putnam. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele with 10 minutes, Alex. Until the weekend. It's been uh, quite a wild week uh, here for stocks. We started off on Monday, that crazy meme stock trade, and I guess today, not a whole lot going on, at least not in equities. No, but if you just look at, say, the week and then in comparison, the S&P and the NASDAQ 100, for example, and the NASDAQ are up for four straight weeks. We haven't seen that since February. Also, the Russell uh, 2000 is up for four straight weeks. We haven't seen that uh, since December. So, you know, there's, there, there's definitely stuff uh, happening. And the S&P and materials, industrials, and energy, all the three best performing sectors today. And that's just my way of talking about the craziness we've seen in copper and silver and even oil is having a nice round today gold at a record high yeah a lot of volatility as well in the treasury space and mm -hmm. in the fx space as well so at least on a cross asset basis there was certainly a lot of action things really got batted around and there are a lot of questions right now kind of about what comes next earnings season's kind of winding down there's not a whole lot of economic data up ahead we had a chance to speak with christian lawrence the senior cross asset macro strategist over at rabble bank to kick us off to the close here's what he had to say about where the market goes next I think we'll continue to see inflows and I think there's further upside from here. It goes back to that liquidity point of view and it really raises the question, are rates restrictive? If we're seeing record highs in equities, we're seeing crypto flying, we're seeing credit spreads tightening throughout the last year, I'd argue rates probably aren't restrictive at the moment. And that was Christian Lawrence at Rabble Bank who helped to kick us off to the close. And here to help take us to those closing bells is Ellen Hazen, Chief Market Strategist at FL Putnam Investment Management. And Ellen, I am curious as to where you think, think things will go next, particularly given it seems like the big catalyst, the things that were really battering this market around, whether to the upside or downside, at least for right now, those appear to be uh, kind of off to the side. Thanks, Romaine. Well, they do say sell in May and go away. So I suppose it's possible that we could see a quiet summer where not much happens. But look, as we look at the S&P 500 this year, it's already up almost 12%. Earnings are going to be up 9% this year. So we've already expanded the multiple uh, by growing faster than the earnings growth this year. So I wouldn't be surprised to see further volatility, and particularly volatility under the surface, uh, not just the overall index level, but what's happening underneath. And so what you've seen, if you look month by month, you've seen a real tug of war between cyclical sectors, like technology, like communications, and more very, very late cycle sectors like utilities and energy. And right now they're they're battling it out. And so it, even though the market seems as though it's gone fairly straight up, it, there have, there's been a lot of rotation under the surface. We think that's going to continue. And we're not sure how much more on an absolute level you can get between now and the end of the year, given that we're already at a, a little bit of a rich multiple. Do you think, though, that that could actually fuel even greater rotation? I mean, if you are of the belief that at least the broad market has kind of tapped out for the year, it seems like at least the general psychology would be people are really now going to start digging a lot deeper into sectors and individual names to find those returns. I think that's absolutely right. You've seen it with the Magnificent Seven, 
where NVIDIA is up almost 90% year to date, but Tesla is down 30% year to date. So you're seeing the divergence in that part of the market. And then that's really writ large everywhere else. If you look at the different sectors, if you look at individual stocks, for example, if you look at the travel stocks, you saw booking do really well last week while Expedia really tumbled. So it is not it it, it is a stock pickers market. It is not a buy and hold mm -hmm. market. And I think we're gonna continue to see more rotation under the surface. Does the rotation go into cyclical sectors? I've mentioned industrials, materials, and energy, the best performing uh, um, uh, sectors today in the S&P. Do you need more cyclical exposure? And if so, where? Well, we do want to increase cyclical exposure. And we're doing that by looking at both consumer discretionary cyclicals as well as some industrial cyclicals. So in consumer discretionary, we like booking that they had a really strong quarter. It's a very reasonably valued stock for high teens growth, which is pretty hard to find these days. And then on the industrial cyclical side, assuming the infrastructure spending goes ahead as expected, we like United Rentals. That's a company that maybe a lot of company, uh, a lot of people haven't heard of, but they're the largest publicly traded rental heavy equipment company in the country. And for 10% growth, you're only paying 15 times earnings. So with the acceleration in infrastructure spend, they should do really well. So I do think you want to see increased focus in cyclicals going forward. But we do need to, of course, watch what the Fed is doing mm -hmm. and watch what's happening in the overall economy. Because if and when the economy slows dramatically, th that's when you're, you're going to want to start to exit those cyclical names and get more defensive. But we don't think that's going to happen in the near term. So you just have to be really active on that. Where do, where do financials fit into that? Well, financials have been a stealth sector uh, performing quite well uh, year to date. And if you look month by month, it's really in the last month or two that they've picked up. So it's not just banks that have done well. Some insurance companies have done well as well. Also, of course, some of the insurance companies have the strong property and casualty pricing that's been happening. And the brokers, of course, have, have done pretty well also. The, the key risk, of course, with the banks is what happens on the regulatory front, which we don't have a lot of clarity on right now. But it, what, from what we know, it doesn't look as though any increased capital re requirements will be too hard. Mm -hmm. And of course, the yield curve. And if the yield curve becomes normalized, then that's it, so much the better for the banks. So we're overweight financials. We like most part of the financial sector. Uh, what about uh, what, what's going on in the chip space, Ellen? Next week, we're going to get NVIDIA earnings, a kind of the, what for a lot of people is going to be that big look at the AI trends and uh, adoption when it comes to data centers, adoption when it comes to chips. I know there are a few names that you like in that space that aren't named NVIDIA. <laughs> well, there are so many ways to play artificial intelligence. As we're looking at chips, one thing you can do is you can own AMD. That's been a, a, a great stock for a while now. And they are not as good as, as NVIDIA is in the AI front, but they're getting there. They're getting there pretty quickly and they have a, a great chip. Uh, we also like LAM Research, uh, which is a semiconductor capital equipment company. You start, saw strong results out of Applied Materials last night, another semi-cap equipment company. We like ASML. Uh, they make the lithography machines, of course. So there are quite a few areas that you can uh, buy that are going to be exposed to the AI trend. I think longer term, the risk with that is at what point will the hyperscalers decide that either A, they really need to monetize this and are they able to, or B, they slow down spending on the, that AI spending that they're doing in the cloud and in the data centers. Yeah. We don't see that happening yet, but that's the key thing to watch for because there is so much built into these stocks. All right, Ellen, going to have to leave it there. Always wonderful to talk to you. Have a great weekend. Ellen Hazen, Chief Market Strategist at FL Putnam Investment Management, helping us count down to the close. Just about uh, two and a half minutes until we get there, Alex. And, of course, everyone looking ahead to those NVIDIA numbers uh, coming out uh, after the bell on Wednesday. Yep, we had Emerald Silverman on, I think it was last week, from RBC, talking about how the exuberance in the options market, uh, the call options, isn't really there this time. I wonder if that's changed mm. in the last couple of days. But, yeah. And I have to also wonder if that changes the d dynamic of when the numbers come out. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And we get a few other uh, names in that tech space here that will also help to sort of shape the narrative, either for the better or for the worse, as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now.
And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You heard it all take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with Tim Stenovic and, oh, Carol has a day off. Shanali Bass again <laughs> for uh, Carol Master, who was uh, taking a well-deserved, once again, four-day week. Uh, welcome to all of our audiences <laughs> across all of our Bloomberg platforms. Shanali, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Right. I am very much here for you today, Romaine. <laughs> oh, thank you. Somebody is. Tim, how about you? <laughs> I'm feeling good as well. I'm also here for you. But I'm also wondering where the action is when it comes yeah. to the equity market today. And I think kind of everyone, you know, after it's a big week, thanks to a couple Fed-friendly economic data prints. But I think people are taking a step back, Shanali, and saying, okay, well, Wednesday we get NVIDIA earnings. That's like the next big catalyst for big moves. Yeah, and in the middle of the week, it was kind of like everything is fine. Everything was exuberant. You had some key moments really past the market. But there was divergence in indices today. And when we looked at the bond market, we are back above 480, guys. Yeah, I was looking at that 480 level all week and seeing if we were going to breach it. And indeed, we have, although still some optimism there in the bond market around the potential for cooling inflation and lower rates ahead. I just feel like the equity market just doesn't care about the bond market, like whether they move in tandem, and you have seen that happen uh, this week, or you see higher yields. I mean, it feels like if we're going to set up for a range, anything below five for the 10 years seems to be something that the equity market can digest at this point. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, we keep pulling our hair out over what the Fed's going to do next, what's on work. And look, I get it. I, I get that there's got to be some sort of awareness as to what the Fed does next. But I don't know. I mean, we hit record highs yesterday. It looks like we're, at least on a couple of the indices, we're hitting another record highs here. So I don't know if five and a half didn't break this market and, and, and that's the velocity to five and a half didn't break the market. Why is saying at five and a half? Mm -hmm. Why am I supposed mm -hmm. to believe that's going to break the market as well? Let's walk you through the numbers here because a relatively good day and, a, and a, an extremely good week here. The Dow Jones Industrial Average would spend a good portion of the day in the red. And yesterday traded above 40,000, but could not hold that level into the close. Now it looks like it is going to close at that 40,000 level. You like nice round Woo numbers where you got one. <laughs> yeah, put your hat on, Alex. Mm -hmm. you, you finally time to wear it. 4,000, 004.41. I don't know if your hat just says 40,000 or if you were precise enough to pick that, but that's good enough for a three tenths <laughs> of a percent gain on the day. The S&P 500 back above, uh, back above 5,300, six points higher, a tenth of a percent on a percentage basis. The NASDAQ composite, though, it's going to finish the day in the red, but only fractionally down about a tenth of a percent. Similar story for the NASDAQ 100 and the Russell 2000. We're just going to call it unchanged on the day, uh, lower uh, by a fraction of a percent. But we should point out all the major indices posting weekly gains. Uh, taking a look at under the hood of the S&P 500, we did see 290 stocks move higher on the day today, 211 ended up moving lower, Alex. So not quite equally split, but pretty close. No, but it's really the cyclicals that are doing it today for the S&P. I'm taking a look at IMAP right now. So energy is up by over 1%, outperforming uh, the rest of the sectors within the S&P. Then you have materials, obviously driven by what we're seeing, copper and gold and silver. Uh, and then you have the financials. Financials are up by about six tenths uh, of 1%. So from that perspective, relatively broad base. On the negative side, you get tech actually underperforming information technology, down by about five tenths of 1%, consumer staples and real estate uh, trading a little bit uh, light as well. But I got you know, it's so hard to make a lot of hay uh, out of what we're seeing, to be honest. And Romaine, you know, I really do agree with you, too, that if we got past certain hurdles for the bond market and if earnings continue to deliver and earnings growth and sales estimates continue to rise, I mean... Yeah. How do you not buy stocks at this point? Yeah, I can't just say, though, I am a little worried. And you know, want to know why? Because I feel like the earnings season's mm -hmm. over, right? Uh, the economic data is kind of coming to a trickle. So is this all going to be just like hopes and dreams that people are going to buy? Or do we have to kind of mm -hmm. wait for, I guess, well, I guess into July when we get into the next earnings cycle or something like that? I, I don't buy into the sell and may go away, but it does kind of make you wonder yeah. what is going to be the upside catalyst. I, I think maybe NVIDIA next week. Maybe it's yeah, June, yeah. What, June 12th for the next Fed meeting. We're already looking ahead to that. Um, and a lot of Fed speakers between now and then, too. So, yeah, we'll see what actually moves markets. Um, one thing that did move today are the gainers that I got an eye on. And I want to talk a little bit about Chubb because it had its best two-day period going all the way back to 2020, thanks in part to what Warren Buffett did over the last few months, thanks to a 13F filing that we got up here into on Wednesday afternoon. Berkshire Hathaway building that stake in the company. Shares higher once again today, finishing higher by 3.6%. Chubb shares hitting another record, and they've added more than $8 billion of market value in those two days. Chubb also did say in a, in a statement yesterday that shareholders approved a boost to its dividend. Uh, I want to talk about Reddit, because Reddit shares uh, surging today. This after the company said it forged a partnership with Open 
OpenAI that will bring its content to ChatGPT and other products, while also helping the company add new AI features to its forums. Uh, according to a statement from both companies, this agreement will, quote, enable OpenAI's tools to better understand and showcase Reddit content, especially on recent topics. So what the deal is going to do, it's going to allow OpenAI to, to display content from Reddit and also train its AI systems on its partner's data. We should note that Reddit's content has long been used to train data for AI models, including those of OpenAI. It's something that they talked a lot about in the run-up to the IPO just a couple of months ago. And finally, shares of Robinhood, oh, uh, Reddit up by 10% today. Shares of Robinhood also surging. They had their best week of the year because the meme stock mania just continues to grip, uh, grip markets 12% higher on the day today. Uh, Bank of America actually raised their recommendation on Robinhood to buy from underperform. The analysts noted that rising retail engagement and accelerating organic growth will drive 2025 and 2026 earnings up. So maybe meme stock Shanali are here to stay? Uh, perhaps they are, actually, and we'll talk more about that in just a second here. But I do want to talk about what was down on the day, because, of course, under the hood, we know that the picture was a little mixed. I want to start here with Paramount. You did see this being the worst decliner here in the S&P 500 shares down about 4.9 percent or so on the day. And, of course, we know Paramount has been caught up in that acquisition story. What happens to the future of it? And, of course, there's just kind of other news going on in Hollywood here. A union representing laborers are in talks with the studios on a new contract for stagehands, and uh, that will resume in early June. So a lot of news on the front for entertainment. I also want to show you LAM research, because it was interesting, one of the indices that was down on the day was the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index. Interesting to see it down ahead of NVIDIA earnings next week. NVIDIA also down today, but LAM research down even more and was a drag on a couple of indexes on the day a little bit now. You have it down around 3.3% on the day today. Another one I want to point out here is Sun Power. This is where the meme stocks come mm -hmm. back here. Because, mm. of course, this was a meme stock driven stock this week. You have seen it take a leg lower after a rally of more than 90% over two days. At one point, it was down more than 23% on the day. Now down around, you know, closing around 13% or so. And there was an analyst cut as well at Wolf Research down Graded the recommendation on the stock to underperform yeah. here. Uh, the stock will come back to reality once the I was, short. I was pressure. looking at some of the other names too. I mean, obviously GameStop is down, but like Faraday Futures that mm -hmm. was down 38 percent. Fisker is down 16, 17. So it looks like a lot of these names. I mean, it looks like some of them still posted weekly gains, but uh, nowhere near uh, those those big uh, jumps that we saw Alex at the start of the week. Yep, aren't taking a look at yields because, you know, the one thing that I'll also down uh, is bond market. So yields popping higher a little bit here, ending the week. Interesting kind of round trip. If you take a look at, at sort of the moving averages, the two-year yield uh, closed above the 50 and 200-day moving averages after kind of blowing below them earlier in the week. Plus the 10-year is sitting right at that 50-day. And I bring all this up because how we then open on, you know, Sunday night and Monday morning could be quite interesting uh, depending on where the technicals kind of suss out. But you are definitely seeing the propensity for higher yields despite stocks and bonds moving together earlier in the week. Yeah. Okay, it's Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. I know, you know, you're getting ready to go to your Hamptons place, everybody. But if I'm we were going to remain, so in, that's fine. Yeah, that's where yeah. I, that's where I go to because I don't have one. Alex and I are one. way too crunchy to go <laughs> to the Hamptons. Uh, but if we were in <laughs> if we were in Florida, uh, maybe we'd be getting ready to go to the Hamptons of Wall Street South, which is not going to be what is that? West Palm Beach. No, it's actually going to be Cocoa Beach. An island oh. in the Bahamas. In the Bahamas? Yeah, that's if, if a developer is has there, his is there way, like a Raphael that Reyes. takes you there? Yes. That, I mean, how do you yep. get there? There are fast ferries. You can take exactly. your helicopter. I mean, there's options. You can take you your boat. You could take your own boat. Yeah. Someone would just take their oh, own boat. Oh, my own boat. Oh, yes. Yes. Own boat. Why, why didn't I think of that? My uh, own. You could buy a cheap boat, too, and just take it down there, <laughs> oh, too. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chanel. <laughs> why not? You know what, though? It's actually pretty close to parts of Florida. It's like, you know, if you're not stuck on Hamptons traffic on a weekend. Uh, instead, you can take your helicopter from Miami or Wall Street South, Chanali to York? this island. Oh, yes. New York? How long does it take to get from New York? Yeah, you've uh, got to fly down longer. there first. Oh. Depends on your mode of transportation, Roman. 
No, okay, I'm just saying there's a jitney right outside the, the office. Yeah, they are waiting in line, then you got to sit in traffic. Uh, so anyway, the, so they, the, can't they just do like one of those duck boats and they can just you know just take us right out to shore and you yeah, know, but you and know, just sail away. It's, it's hard with all our luggage. But this is a really interesting piece. You guys should definitely read it. Luggage. It looks like it could be beautiful. The, it would be, the island would be called Bimini. It's like 48 nautical miles uh, off the coast. Like this is you know this is the Hamptons for the ultra rich down in Wall Street South. I do it. I know people who have done it, but the worry here is that too many people do it. <laughs> once, once people find out about something, it gets less fun when everyone's there. It's tough stuff. It's tough stuff. It's tough stuff. <laughs> they, haven't they been saying about that, that about the Hamptons for the last 40 <laughs> <Forever>. years? <Yeah. laughs> all right, well, we're going to see all you guys at Romaine's a little uh, later this oh, weekend. Oh, yeah, please, yeah, please, please stop. Right now. <laughs> all right. That is going to do it for Beyond the Bell. It's our cross-platform coverage of the market. Close on Bloomberg TV and radio. Bloomberg Originals in on YouTube. Have a great weekend, everyone. We'll be back same time, same place on Monday. All right, coming up here on Bloomberg Television, a lot more going on, including a conversation with the CEO of the oldest bank in the country, BNY Mellon, celebrating 240 years in business. I had a chance to sit down with Robin Vince for an exclusive interview. Going to bring you some highlights from that when we come back after the break. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, welcome back to The Close. I'm Romain Bostic. A somewhat tepid day, at least as far as a price action on the day, but not enough to erase what is four straight weeks of gains for major indices here in the U.S. Unchanged on the day for the S&P 500, but back above that 5,300 level, the Dow Jones Industrial Average finally closing out at that 40,000 level, a level that it flirted with yesterday but could not hold. That is the good news here. You also saw a lot of good news overseas in China. The animal spirits there have really taken off here. The Hang Seng Index continues to power higher, largely on the back of a resurgence of those Chinese tech stocks. But the yield story is still a big story here. Here. And while we did see that movement in yields, it wasn't enough to really rattle markets. A lot of folks actually saying you could start to see significant more Treasury buying right now, which actually might tamp down yields just a bit. As far as some of the individual movers here on the day, I want you to take a look at the screen behind me. Sealed Air had been on a 12-day run. They were trying to make it 13, which would have been its longest winning streak since it went public back in 1998, but it slipped into the close, down about two-tenths of a percent here on the day. The biggest gainer on a weekly basis in the S&P 500, well, that belongs to Moderna. It's on a five-day run right now, only a tenth of a percent on the day, but the gains that it's added over that five days, remarkable to be sure. The flip side of that is Paramount, the biggest decliner on a weekly basis in the S&P 500 and one of the biggest decliners on a daily basis. And then take a look at GameStop. What a difference just a few days make. Remember, we had that two-day run with GameStop Monday Monday and Tuesday that saw the shares almost triple. Most of those gains erased here, including a 19% drop today. On a weekly basis, GameStop still higher by about 27%. All right, and one of the big stories we're taking a look at today is, well, the history of well, one of the oldest banks in the world. Bank of New York Mellon, marking its 240 years in business. The bank was founded back in 1784 by Alexander Hamilton, making it the oldest bank here in the U.S. and one of the top 20 banks in terms of age worldwide that's still in continuous operations. I had a sat down to, uh, to chance to sit down exclusively with the CEO of BNY Mellon, Robin Vince, to discuss the milestone and, more importantly, What's next? How do you keep a firm like this relevant? Take a listen. 240 years is a long time. We've uh, operated over four centuries of history, particularly New York history, and we're getting together with some clients to uh, actually enjoy that and make sure that we mark the moment. We're actually the oldest operating, longest operating company in New York. We're the oldest member of the S&P 500 and uh, Fortune 500 and the first stock listed on the New York Stock Exchange. But we're looking forward. So innovation, at the end of the day, is an important part of the story, too. Well, let's talk about that innovation. I mean, you don't get to 240 years by just dumb luck. I mean, even if you go through the list of some of the banks that sort of were born uh, out of the birth of this nation, at least here in the United States, and the ones that are still there, I mean, what gets you to another 240? It's not just going to be the same playbook, is it? Well, I think you're exactly right yeah. that innovation is at the very heart of that. You only get to be old if you're resilient 
and if you're innovative, focused on your customers. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's our clients that guide our progress as a company and to operate through all of the different ups and downs that we see, the world wars that have occurred over our history, the very birth of the nation. Literally, uh, the British were leaving just months before uh, the foundation of our company. You have to be resilient, you have to focus on your customers, and you have to innovate. When we talk about sort of the next big structural changes that are going to shake up, shake up banking, shake up the finance industry, right now there's a lot of talk about AI. Is that moment here now, or is this still something in the future that you're preparing for? Well, the answer is both. Mm -hmm. It is here. There are opportunities now, but those opportunities are going to get more and more exciting over the coming years. I was actually just back from the West Coast where I spent time with some of the luminaries of the AI uh, industry, really hearing their thoughts and participating with some others in a few different sessions and just trying to peek over the horizon about what's in store. And I think it's going to be very important. I think it's going to create great opportunities for our client facing businesses to be able to do more for our clients. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to help us to run our company better. And I also think it's going to be something that's going to give benefit to our people to be able to take some of the drudgery out of some aspects of work and actually help them uh, to be able to focus on the things that are going to add the most value. So I think it's, it, to be honest, it can be a win-win-win, but it's going to take a little bit of time. All right, well, let's talk a little bit more about what's going on today. You just had uh, earnings about a month ago here. They please a lot of investors. The turnaround that you've been orchestrating there seems to have really taken hold. There's a lot of focus right now on organic growth, or investors are focusing on organic growth. How much do you see that organic growth rate, the one that you just posted in the most recent quarter, continuing through the rest of the year? Well, our team has been laser focused over the past 18 months on helping our firm really be more for our clients. And that's the very heart for us of organic growth. We have this incredible franchise around the world. We serve so many clients all around the world in all parts of the financial system. And yet, we do relatively few things with many of them. So the opportunity to do more of the things that we do, bring more of our platforms to our clients, mm -hmm. is a very significant opportunity. We have a terrific franchise, and so it's really about approaching it through that lens. That creates organic growth. We are excited about the fact that we have really been generating more organic growth, and obviously we're hopeful that we'll be able to continue to do that um, as part of our journey. Geographically, where is most of that growth going to come from? Is it going to be here in the U.S., North America, or Europe, Asia, Middle East? Where? It's truly around the world. Mm -hmm. We serve clients uh, all across the globe. Now, I do think there's a lot of opportunity in the U.S. right now, given everything that's going on in the economy here. Mm -hmm. But we're also in the import-export business of financial services. So we help our international clients access the United States markets, and we help our U.S. clients be able to go out and access markets all around the world, whether it be people who want to bring capital in mm -hmm. or who want to be able to go take capital into other parts of the world. We have that knowledge, that expertise, and the local on-the-ground experience to be able to help clients. Are you seeing more demand for that, not only just from existing clients, but from potentially new clients as well? Well, there's certainly demand in the United States uh, for capital because the, the, the U.S. economy has really surprised many people, I think, with how well it's been doing. And there's, there's just a lot of interest in participating in this market. And then outside of the U.S., the world's a pretty complicated space right now. We have wars in different regions. Mm -hmm. We have complexities on the geopolitics side. And so clients want that expert navigation advice on how to actually go about doing their businesses in the most efficient ways. When you look at some of the disruptions going on out there geopolitically, the wars, uh, disruptions and shipping routes, everything else going on, do you see those as sort of passing things, meaning something that could be resolved within the next couple of years and then we go back to whatever the normal is? Or is this something we're just going to have to live with and adjust to for years to come? Well, here's where I'm going to go back to being 240 years old as a company. I obviously can't look back myself over that whole period of time. But the world is a complicated place, and we have had many episodes in history where there have been different things, tensions that go on. It can be in politics, it can be in geopolitics. And so I think we should all recognize that we have to be prepared for those types of uh, situations. Mm -hmm. And we actually think that being resilient and being prepared is just part of how you have to operate as a great company uh, these days. Uh, with regards to economic conditions, both here in the U.S., and abroad. There's been a lot of talk about where the economic cycle is 
and whether it's going to be favorable to banks. When you look at the economic conditions, you look at the interest rate backdrop, are you comfortable? Well, another way that you get to be old is never by being comfortable, by always challenging yourself. Mm -hmm. Got to be a little bit yeah. uh, skeptical about the world in order to make sure that we're looking around the corners, seeing the risks. This was a lesson that some firms learned the hard way mm -hmm. last year when they weren't prepared. So we view being cautious, thoughtful and prepared as an essential part of operating. Now, having said all of that, I do think that the U.S. economy has surprised to the upside over the course of the past year or so. We've seen that with inflation being stickier. It's kind of a nice problem to have because it's really been the manifestation of the fact that we're benefiting from a whole bunch of different things in the U.S. right now. We have interest from abroad in terms of investing in the United States. We have a relative abundance of raw materials, not everything, but a lot. We have energy independence. That's a big deal. We certainly saw the examples of that, of not having that in Europe over the course of the past couple of years. We have mm -hmm. availability of labor. Those things are contributing to a very significant uh, upside in the U.S. economy. We've had a little bit of industrial policy. We've got the innovation that we just talked about for AI. Mm -hmm. These things collectively are really creating a pretty powerful economic engine. Now, not everybody has been participating in it, mm -hmm. but for the 60 percent of Americans mm -hmm. who participate in the stock market, yeah. there's been a psychological boost there when they see those new highs, and that contributes to spending, and there's a circular process here which feeds back to inflation. And that is the CEO of BNY Mellon, Robin Vince, celebrating the 240th anniversary of that financial institution. A lot more coming up here on The Close. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. All right, U.S. industrial production numbers out this week showing activity stagnated in April. The slowdown caused by a drop in factory output signaling the manufacturing se sector is still struggling for traction. Timothy Fiore is joining us right now. He's the chair of the ISM Manufacturing Big Business Survey Committee, and he expects the sluggish growth to continue. Joins us right now. All right, Tim, let's get right to it here. I mean, I, I, I feel like this manufacturing sector has been kind of, it's kind of fits and starts, trying to sort of reboot itself, trying to find some traction here. But then every time we get these ISM numbers or some of the numbers from your competitors here, they continue to show a manufacturing sector still in the back foot. What gives? Well, you know, Remain, you know, we've been recovering. We thought we were in the trough at the end of last year, starting in August, all the way through December. And then there was clear signs of, of uh, expansion in January through April. But that expansion has been really weak. So one of the things that we do, it's the same panel that does the PMI every month. We do a forecast twice a year. We do one in December, and I was on your show with, uh, with Vani and Scarlett and reporting on that. It was very optimistic. The forecast had come in before uh, Chairman Powell had decided to cap rates out. So that was all tailwind for us. And then we do an update in May. So let's talk about the revenue growth side, and we can talk about the inputs, and then the capacity expansion, which I think is really important. So. You know, on the revenue side, uh, we closed last year with less than 1% growth on the revenue side compared to 2022. That was really weak growth. Yeah. We uh, Right now, we believe that we'll close this year at a 2.1% revenue growth profile. That's, you know, so that's pretty good. That's very similar to what probably GDP is going to end up to be. But back in December, we really thought we would be about 5.6% growth. So there's definitely a tailback. And I think if you look at the detail, we asked some special questions in the survey, too. One of the things we ask is, is demand meeting your expectations? Well, 17% of the respondents said it is exceeding expectations. Yeah. 32% said it is not. So that's a pretty heavy underweight thing. So, you know, I think what's happened here, we're definitely less optimistic than we were in December, uh -huh. but we're still growing, but it's going to be a slow growth. Think 49 to 53, I think. Is there, the is there something, months. though, that maybe breaks us out of that? Because I was looking at the, the numbers, and then I was also looking at some of the more inflationary numbers in that report, too, the idea that some of the costs for a lot of these manufacturers are also still elevated. And I kind of scratched my head. I was like, uh, like what's going to give them the confidence to do more? I, I, if it's not demand and if the input costs are still high, what's left? Right. So, you know, I think we were optimistic in December. Remember, this, the forecast we put out was before the Fed capped rates and even said that they were going to drop probably three times. So now I think we're kind of drawing back saying, OK, you know, we didn't get that tailwind. So let's be a little bit more conservative here. A 2.1 percent growth is not bad. I mean, that's very consistent with pre-pandemic good times. 
So, you know, one of the other things that they've come back with, they've said that they don't expect suppliers to have difficulty delivering through the rest of the year. So they're, they're really saying that the demand that we have now is going to be fairly weak. We've been saying that in the PMI every month, too. And it's probably going to remain that way throughout the rest of the year, which is a bit alarming. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to your point here, we, we closed last year with six tenths less headcount yeah. than we did when we started the year. We now think we're going to end up closing this year with three tenths more headcount. That's really it's in the air band, you know. Yeah. But in, in December, we thought we we're going to expand two percent. So, yeah. you know, employment's not going to expand. But, you know, the big yeah. number here is prices, I think. All right. You want to talk about prices? Uh, well, we're going to have to do that another time, uh, Tim. We're up against a commercial break. Always great to talk to you, though. Tim Fiore, chair of the ISM Manufacturing Business Survey Committee. We'll be back in a moment. More coming up right here on The Close on Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for our next up segment. This is where we highlight the entrepreneurs and founders really moving the needle for our economy, the markets, and technology. Now, much of the world has made great strides recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic that shook the global economy and the overall health of our communities. Our next guest founded a company that aims to catch high-risk viruses and disease before an outbreak, and it's doing it through use of sewage water data. Joining us right now to explain how all this works is Mariana Matus, CEO and founder of BioBot Analytics. And uh, Mariana, I'm really fascinated by this. This kind of came on my radar maybe like a year, year and a half ago. We were having this conversation about, uh, you know, the fact that nobody was getting tested for COVID. No one really knew whether COVID was still out there. And they were talking about this company, your, your company, BioBot Analytics, and how you can take all this data that we have from wastewater and sewage and actually kind of extrapolate where we are, not just with COVID, but with a lot of other things as well. Kind of explain this in layman's terms. I mean, we're obviously not in your level scientifically. So just kind of explain how that works. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, we spun out of MIT of PhD research that was happening on campus. And our vision is very simple. Wastewater is not waste. Wastewater is data. And our mission at BioBot is to transform our wastewater infrastructure into real-time public health observatories. So today we collect and analyze sewage for various viruses of concern, including COVID-19, influenza A, influenza B, and RSV, as well as chemicals like fentanyl, meth, cocaine, and nicotine that drive a lot of overdoses mm -hmm. in the population. So, so and our partners, which are communities distributed all over the country, collect them and ship them back to our lab where we process them uh, with our team of scientists. So, so give me a sense as to what that data tells you. So let's just take, you can take one of those viruses or drugs that you mentioned here. When you get that data and you see, let's say those levels are elevated, what exactly is that telling you though? I mean, can you, is that easy to just extrapolate and say, okay, this community is, is being hit by this or are, are there a lot of false signals that might pop up as well? The data is very uh, trustworthy and very accurate reflection of what's happening in the population. So what the wastewater data shows is it is a living indicator for what we will see in the clinic and in new hospital admissions as, as much as two to three weeks in advance. And the right now, especially after the state of the COVID-19 pandemic emergency has ended, the only two data sets that are endorsed by the CDC are wastewater data and hospitalizations. And wastewater data is going to be a leading indicator, whether for COVID cases, um, flu cases, as well as overdoses caused mm -hmm. by some of these substances. Can you give us a sense here of, of who you've partnered with so far? I mean, what types of municipalities are we talking about? We've been very fortunate to be able to work now across most states in the U.S. And sometimes we partner with a city like, you know, the city of Boston, sometimes with a state like the state of Maine mm -hmm. uh, or California, and sometimes also at the federal level with uh, organizations like the CDC and NIH. Mm -hmm. We've been very fortunate to be able to bring this data, not just directly to the participating communities and to those leaders, right. but we also engage in a lot of advocacy 
uh, so we make a lot of trips to the White House in D.C. Mm -hmm. I have been able to testify in front of Congress, and we have a very active social following yeah. as well of uh, informed citizens that like to follow the data. So is most of the revenue that you generate, though, it comes from those relationships with the states and, and maybe even the federal government. Are there private companies or private entities that also use your data? Yes. To date, most of our growth and revenue has come from the public sector and the use of this intelligence to be able to create public health policies more real time, as well as to evaluate what's working or what's not. However, uh, about a year ago, we crossed this inflection point where the data was you know, representative enough of the US population and dense enough, where we can really begin to build analytics products for other players in the healthcare sector. So by now we're working with some of the biggest biopharma companies in the country and in the world. And we're looking to also partner up with um, pharmacy chains and hospital and other providers in order to bring this new type of more representative and equitable and real-time data to their mm -hmm. own practices. I am curious, how, how big of an industry is this right now beyond just what you and your folks are doing over at BioBot? Do you have a lot of competitors in this space? Yes, it's been an industry that, you know, when we started, we were the only ones and it felt like we were kind of shouting out there that we should care about this data. But the COVID-19 pandemic changed that. At scale, it demonstrated how valuable this data is, how much, how important it is that communities invest in this data proactively, both in the government side and in companies. And now what we're seeing is this growth where this market is booming and we're seeing a lot of smaller and bigger players coming in, which I think it's really exciting yeah. because it means that we basically created a market and that's just really, really, um, amazing. You did, and it is amazing, particularly given how young this company is, how young you are. Uh, as you sort of build this company further and as you yourself age and one day you will have to sort of look back on what you built here, what do you want it to be, say, like 20 years from now or 25 years from now? What, what would make you happy to see? I think this is just the beginning. I think that it's already amazing that wastewater data is considered one of the breakthrough technologies from the pandemic, together with maybe the RNA vaccines. Um, now people are investing, doubling down on it. And I think what's going to happen is even more use cases of the data and the integration of this novel data with AI to be able to answer questions that have never been possible before. So I really see this opportunity to build um, a global radar and to be able to bring this data everywhere, just as we look at weather data, mm -hmm. uh, that we can pick up our phone and we can look at our forecasts in yeah. our community, but we can also build very sophisticated models to predict hurricanes or other outlier weather events. And that's, that's the vision that wastewater data becomes that pervasive in the healthcare ecosystem uh, and really makes it more equitable because it yeah. represents one. All right. Uh, this is uh, really fa uh, fascinating stuff. And I have to tell you, I I'm, I'm going to be tracking this company for as long as you continue to build it. Mariana, really appreciate you taking time to be with us today. Mariana uh, Matus there. She's the CEO and founder of BioBot Analytics, which is a global leader in wastewater epidemiology. All right, we do want to stay uh, in this broader space here. There's been a lot of talk about those windstorms that hit the Houston area in Texas overnight, the uh, worst that we've seen in about 40 years, leaving devastating consequences. Wind gusts at least 78 miles per hour at one point, leaving more than 800,000 customers without power and at least four people dead. Noreen Malik joining us right now, Bloomberg News Power and Climate Disaster Reporter, to talk a little bit more about this. And Noreen, first, just kind of paint a picture of what we know now that those winds have died down and the dust has settled here. Uh, what exactly happened? There was a line of windstorms coming from West Texas that went through the middle of the state and eastward, and it left devastation. It uprooted trees. I talked to colleagues and sources there. They described darkness, trees, things being shattered, power lines on the ground. So it'll take time to get a true assessment of 
how much damage and how long it will take. Centerpoint, the utility, said it could take several days in the worst case um, areas and maybe even longer. Mm -hmm. um, putting up poles and putting up the transformers on top of those poles yeah. takes time, too. Well, and the other issue, too, anytime you have these types of storms, of course, the big, bigger concern are the flooding that typically follows those storms. What do we know right now about water levels and what are officials predicting as far as those water levels are worsening? Well, Houston itself is a flat area, so it tends to flood with rain, heavy rain there. And there's a flood watch there in other parts of Texas. Um, going out to Tuesday. So there's a lot of concern watching on how that unfolds, especially uh, as how, uh, in terms of how it affects recovery um, and further damage. And so as we sort of move to this next phase, the cleanup, obviously, the assessment of what's happened, there's a lot of questions, Noreen, as you know, about the stability of Texas and its power systems, whether it's sleet storms, whether it's hurricanes, or whether it's a storm like what we got last night here. Are there longer term efforts here to, I guess, build up and bolster the energy grid and build up and bolster infrastructure so when the next big storm comes, you don't have these types of consequences. Yes, and that's an incredibly difficult task because the storms are getting more severe and different geology, like Texas being flat and other, like New York State has like, or sorry, New England has granite and make the geology itself makes it difficult in terms of how you can plan whether you can dig can you underground power lines the stress in texas is especially notable because population is growing so fast there um, and demand and power demand has been rebounding faster there in the last two years than anywhere else in the country and they're sort of seen as like a canary in the coal mine in terms of like if texas can figure out how to deal with this so very strong power demand growth yeah. while enabling an energy transition. Like, what is it going to cost to actually defend it against extreme weather and rebuild or recover faster? All right. It's definitely the biggest question. All right. And a question, of course, we'll, uh, we'll continue to ask. Noreen doing some great work. Noreen Malik there uh, with uh, Bloomberg, a closer look at those storms that swept through Texas uh, over the last uh, 24 hours. Uh, we do want to uh, go back uh, to the markets here in the U.S. as we close out the day and the week. And it is a record day and a record week for the S&P 500 above the 5,300 level. Uh, four straight weeks again, the longest weekly win streak going back to February. But one of the bigger news is out there right now involves the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It's been in existence for 128 years and never until today has it closed above 40,000. Reaching that mark here for the first time, a close above that mark for the first time as market euphoria continues apace. Your 10-year yield at 4.4 and change. The dollar relatively unchanged on the day in a big week and a big day in the commodity space. A lot more coming up here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. All right, Blue Origin, the space company run by Jeff Bezos, is set to resume space tourism flights this Sunday. This after it had to stop crewed operations two years ago following a mid-flight mishap, uh, Bloomberg's Nate Langson took a deeper look at how the race for commercial space dominance all started. The largest single constellation of satellites orbiting our planet is run by a mercurial individual who needs no introduction. It's this guy. It achieves this by maintaining a vast relay network in low Earth orbit. That's the area higher than a jetliner, but below a GPS satellite. Right now, Starlink has more than 5,600 satellites in orbit. And it accomplished all this in less time than it took James Cameron to make a second Avatar movie. At one point, SpaceX envisioned launching up to 42,000 satellites. But this speed and relative success has raised eyebrows, concerned ones in government, and excited ones in the boardrooms of potential rivals. It's essentially a company trying to disrupt a somewhat complacent marketplace. 
All right, well, from uh, Elon Musk to Jeff Bezos uh, to, of course, Richard Branson, uh, quite a few folks right now are really trying to stake their claim to space, whether it's for, I guess, commercial reasons, whether it's for industrial reasons, or whether it's for tourism. Our next guest joining us right now knows a lot about that. Craig Curran is president of Depray. It's a group of travel companies which specializes in, quote, unquote, extreme travel. And, of course, one of the most extreme uh, travel tickets out there these days is a trip into space. Craig, great to have you here uh, on the program. I I'm really fascinated by this. I just want to know, like, how much demand is there out there? Because every time we hear about these launches, it always seems like most of the people on these things, they obviously have some relationship with Elon Musk or with Jeff Bezos or someone else. Are we seeing that broaden out where just regular people, and by regular I mean the people who can afford a ticket, uh, are just now just calling them up and say, hey, I want to be on the next flight? We're absolutely seeing uh, growth in demand. Now, um, the demand is concentrated in a few end users. These are obviously high net worth individuals. Uh, but as this industry matures and more and more product becomes available, we're seeing an increase in demand. And that demand is actually driving an increase in prices from where they started, say, in 2010, 2011, 2012, when uh, uh, Vir uh, Virgin Galactic started. It's, um, you know, it really making uh, a headway into uh, their proof of concept in Spaceship Two. So demand is growing. What about the experience itself? I mean, right now we know a lot of these uh, uh, these flights have been relative, relatively into lower uh, Earth's orbit here. So technically, yeah, you're in space, but it's not like, you know, you're at an astro or something, you know, uh, uh, hurtling through the, the cosmos here. Are, are most of the customers or the potential customers, are they satisfied with that? Is that the experience? That's enough for them? So the whole market is changing, but to answer your question quickly, absolutely it is. So there's a whole section of the market that is even below suborbital. So Space Perspective is uh, launching a uh, space capsule that will go to 100,000 feet. Um, they'll be operational in 2025, uh, we hope. They'll be doing a t uh, proof of concept in their actual uh, test vehicle this year. Um, that'll take eight uh, a crew of eight up to 100,000 feet on a six hour journey where you'll be able to see 450 miles in any given direction and get a real taste of the overview effect. Now the overview effect is really driving a lot of this interest. It's the experience you have when you, you see the earth from off the planet. And if you're in suborbital and you will see the uh, iridescent purple uh, boundary of the earth's atmosphere, um, you get a whole perspective against the complete blackness of space, a whole perspective that we are all one race living on one precious planet mm -hmm. and that we all have to do the best we can to take care of it. That experience um, is going to be uh, available to people with space perspective yeah. um, from 100,000 feet. The suborbital, uh, which will get up to about 300,000 feet, will give you a further view, about 1,500 miles, more of the curvature of the Earth. And so... People are signing up for the product that's available right yeah. now, and those are the two mainstream products. You can go orbital, right? and it is available. Um, SpaceX is taking it up with Axiom Space, where you can uh, uh, go up and visit the space station for from 7 to 14 days. Mm -hmm. And there will be a time in the not-too-distant future where there will be space hotels, there will be space condos, yeah. and um, you'll be able to vacation there. Uh, is that going to be affordable, Craig, at some point? I mean, I know anytime you have these new sort of uh, things, it, it always sort of caters at first to the uh, wealthiest of people. But at some point, maybe the costs start to scale in a way where, you know, maybe an average Joe can scrape together enough money and make a trip out of this. Is that something you see in the near future? Absolutely. So if you look at the uh, parallel to air travel, when air travel started, it was for the very, very affluent, very, very limited um, options for folks. And now you see we can travel anywhere around the world in 12 to 14 hours with a couple of bags. Um, that's going to happen to suborbital and orbital. Now, orbital is a big jump from suborbital in terms of the, um, the things you have to accomplish. The exit speed is about 17,500 miles an hour to get to uh, uh, orbital. Um, suborbital is more in the order of 27, 2800 miles an hour. So the whole lot of different technology involved. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the cost of computing, you know, dropping in half every two years, the exponential growth, when you see the new technology breakthroughs, the new manufacturing processes, um, for building these vehicles, materials advances, AI, all of this, there's no question. 
And I always like to joke with people, um, if there's one guy that knows how to bring down the cost, it's Jeff Bezos. Yeah. So if he follows his path with Blue Origin, um, yeah. we, we are, and, and all these entrepreneurs and, and folks that are doing this really are envisioning a democratization of space where yeah. it's opened up to the masses. I, I have to ask you a personal question here. I mean, you're not really just a travel agent. I mean, you are, have done a lot of extreme travel yourself, and I'm told that you already have a ticket on one of the Virgin Atlantic flights. Is that true? I do. I bought my ticket in 2011, about a year after I started uh, my affiliation with Virgin Galactic. I was so excited by what I was selling to my clients that I went ahead and bought my own seat. So I can't wait to go. I'm hoping to go in 27 early 28. Mm -hmm. um, Virgin Galactic is just finishing up the last of its flights with its Spaceship Two class of ships, Unity, that will take place in June. Then they'll be working for the next year or so on development of their Delta class spaceships, which again will be another step in technology. They'll be able to take uh, more uh, uh, six people instead of four per flight. They'll be able to um, cycle faster yeah. for the flights. Um, so all of that's coming, and uh, that should be happening in 26, and I hope uh, 27, early 28, my number will come up. All right, well, me too, and uh, hopefully we can get you back on well before that. A fascinating topic and a fascinating business uh, run by a fascinating man, Craig Curran there, president of the Prey Group of Travel Companies, uh, helping uh, those tourists who want to take those initial flights out into space. Meanwhile, back here on Earth, we're going to set you up for what to watch over the next week. Stick with us. This is a close on Bloomberg. All right, as we wrap up a wild week, we set you up for what could be a busy week. Next week, we start off on Monday with the Dell Technologies World Conference in Las Vegas. A lot of big interviews that Bloomberg will be on the ground for. That includes with the CEO of Dell, the CEO of NVIDIA, as well as a few others. Something to keep an eye on. We'll have full coverage right here on Bloomberg Television. On Tuesday, we get the start of the big retails, retailers coming out with their earnings, and that includes Macy's on Tuesday. We're also going to hear from Target. We're going to hear from TJX. And we also get some earnings in the tech space, a big one. This one out of NVIDIA, that's coming on Wednesday. All eyes right now on AI and on the chip space. On Wednesday, we turn back to the macro with a look at the minutes from the last FOMC meeting. And we're going to go over to Seoul, where there's a big AI summit. This is the second global AI summit, and it's all focused on around safety. A lot of the big uh, leaders from corporate America will be there, as will a lot of the big policymakers around the globe. On Thursday, G7 finance chiefs and central bankers will be meeting in northern Italy. And you have Ecodata back here in the U.S. on Friday with durable goods orders and another look at consumer sentiment. Thanks for joining us this week here on The Close. I'll be back next week for all your coverage. Balance of Power coming up next right here on Bloomberg.